Hi everyone, this is Javin. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. We are here together for the second history session of the Symposium on Disability Cultural Centers in Higher Education. All right, so we have the University of Arizona and the University of Illinois Chicago um, as part of this session. And so we have um, a variety of speakers uh, um, in, in this panel. And first up, I'm going to invite Zoe, Nell, and Haley to introduce themselves and share a bit about UIC's campaign for a disability cultural center. Thanks so much. I'm just going to wait for our slides to pop up. Um, but as I'm doing that, um, I'm going to start by introducing myself and then inviting my co-speakers to do so as well. My name is Zoe Sheets, and I um, went to UAC for undergrad, my master's degree, and I'm now in my last year of medical school at UAC. Um, I've also been an educator and an employee of UAC, so UAC is really um, somewhere I'm familiar with, somewhere that I call home. Um, to identify myself, I am a um, white-skinned person. I have my dark brown hair pulled back in a ponytail. I have clear rimmed glasses, a green shirt with a tan cardigan over it. My background is blurred, but um, there's a sunny window in that background. Um, I identify as queer and as disabled, and so I come to this conversation from the context of those identities um, and having needed accessibility and a cultural presence for disability at UIC from the perspective of someone who's done all the types of education but also worked at UIC. Um, Nell? Hi, everyone. My name is Nell. I use she, her, hers. I am a white woman with short black hair, uh, thick rimmed bluish glasses. I've got a um, dark blue t-shirt on and I am going to read what's on it despite it not being on screen because it reads digital equality is my jam. So it's an access shirt. Um, and my background is actually from uh, Pixar's Finding Nemo um, underground in the reef. Um, so I was a PhD student at the University of Illinois in Chicago at, um, in the Department of Disability and Human Development, but I received um, the master's degree in sciences from the department and left um, prior to completing my PhD to become the first and current accessibility and meetings manager at the American Anthropological Association. Um, so my work has been a lot of access culture building, actually, a lot of cultural shift work in the work that I do beyond just compliance. Um, and then other aspects of my identity that I think are important to um, share and I want to share. Um, I am also queer. I identify as an intersex woman. And I, I identify as the kid of Polish refugees, um, immigrants. So I come into this conversation from that mixture of, of um, history and I've got a physical disability and I'm neurodivergent also. So those are all really key components of who I am and how I come to this uh, conversation. So I'll pass it on over to Haley. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Haley Yoshizaki Gibbons, and I am an assistant professor of biomedical humanities at Hiram College. I was at UIC for seven years, um, earning my PhD and also teaching in the Disability and Human Development Program. And I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a white and Asian woman with shoulder length, dark brown hair, um, bangs, uh, which are my jam um, as well. I never will get rid of them. Um, and I'm wearing a gray shirt. Um, I have on gray glasses and my background is blurred to create an air of mystery. Um, it's really because I don't have the energy to clean. Um, <laughs> so I know, I know, I know a lot of people here will get what I'm talking about. Um, I am also disabled. I have um, psychiatric disabilities as well as identify as neurodivergent. And um, I'm also queer. I identify as bisexual specifically. And um, 
I'm just really excited to have this space. Um, it feels very nostalgic because I haven't actually like seen Nell or Zoe uh, or Roxanna or Margaret or any of the UIC people virtually or in person in a long time um, due to COVID. So I'm just very excited to be having this conversation and to be um, talking about our history and our shared struggle to create a cultural center at UIC. Echoing that, it feels really nice to be back working with y'all again. Um, so on this first slide, we have the words reclaiming our spaces, UAC students fight for a disability cultural center with each of our names. Moving to the next slide, um, the main role that I'll play before I turn it over to Nell to really tell the nitty gritty of our campaign and Haley to talk about some of the things that we learned through this experience, um, I'm gonna set the context for what was happening. So as we've noted, we were at UAC and UAC has these committees called the Chancellor's Committees. Um, there are a variety of them representing different identity groups. And there's specifically one titled the Chancellor's Committee on the Status of Persons with Disabilities. Um, the role of these committees is really to gather information on the experiences and barriers being faced by different population groups at UAC, develop recommendations and present them to the Chancellor. The Status on Persons with Disabilities Committee specifically had a subcommittee titled the Subcommittee on Disabled Student Experiences. And so the way that this committee was functioning is that one or two students at a time would have a voting position on the broader committee, but any student who wanted to be a part of the subcommittee could be, um, and the voting members would take everyone's kind of views, experiences, needs into account when making decisions as a part of the uh, voting committee. And so each of us, Nell, myself, and Haley, served as the chair of this student subcommittee at some point, um, and several of us served as the voting student member of the broader committee. And so moving to the next slide, um, what was the role of it? Uh, SDSE, that's the acronym for that student subcommittee. And so overall, broadly, the role was to serve as a connection point, um, a way for disabled students to connect to one another, because as you know, at this point, there was no disability cultural center. In fact, there was only a disability resource center. And while it was doing important work, it was housed in a building that was quite a ways away from the main East Campus hub where students would really spend their time um, learning, hanging out, grabbing coffee, whatever it was. So first things first, we were a point of connection for disabled students to meet, to get to know each other. Um, and then the other big chunk of what we did is the advocacy, um, identifying what is needed by the disabled student population specifically, how can we pull that information and take it to the broader committee, but also how can we push for these changes without always having to operate under the umbrella of the broader committee. And so through those two main goals, we hosted accessible study sessions. So these were times where we would rent out a space in the library just for everyone to study. We would have um, snacks and coffee, and it was a space where everyone knew that they could safely study in the way that worked for them. So you'd see folks laying on the floor, you'd see folks with fidget toys, you'd see people napping, like whatever someone's mind or body needed in that study space, it was welcome. Um, social events for folks to get to know each other. We conducted surveys to gauge the experiences of disabled students. We trained UAC faculty and staff, especially teaching assistants on disability culture and how to create accessible classrooms. And then finally, as we were doing all of this, one of the big loud things we were hearing from our community is that we were really having to carve out these spaces and that took so much time, effort, energy, and also involved navigating a lot of red tape. Um, when ideally we would just have the space that was ours. We wouldn't have to be doing room reservations or trying to find each other through these kind of um, weird mechanisms. And so the big issue was, why do we have a resource center but we don't have a cultural center? Another really important piece of the context at UAC is that UAC is actually known for having a set of centers for cultural understanding and social change. 
These centers do incredible work um, and they focus on both supporting students from particular identity groups, celebrating that identity and culture, but also educating the community. And so we have a Women's Leadership and Resource Center, a Gender and Sexuality Center, center centers for African American, Arab American, Latino, and Asian American students. And that's such an important part of what makes UIC kind of special, this place where a lot of people um, can come and build community, but also learn about people who are very different and have different experiences from them. And so our lingering question was, if we have a reputation at this university for recognizing and celebrating culture and pushing back on harmful things that may go against a culture, why does disability only get a resource center? We felt that this represented a really common trend in the way disability is treated. It's a barrier to be overcome, a compliance or a legal issue to be managed, an issue that students need resources to navigate, but never is something to be embraced or celebrated. And so we wanted a combined center. I think that most folks on this call will recognize that we didn't necessarily see a, um, okay, so we don't need the resource center. Of course not. Students do need accommodations, need support in getting them. That's a critical part of succeeding um, at an institution with a disability. But we also didn't want it to be separate because to us, access needs, accommodations, things like that are all a part of disability culture. There is no separation. And so we specifically pushed for a combined disability and resource center. And we chose to do that kind of outside of the umbrella of those chancellor's committees. So we worked with the committee in advocating, but we did it a little bit outside of the committee because we knew that unfortunately, the broader chancellor's committee was a representation of the very university we were now going to have to be pushing back against. And so um, that's kind of one of the first things that I would suggest is really be mindful and strategic about the system you're working with, um, working within, and when it makes sense to um, work with it, to work within it, and when it makes sense to step back and kind of push against it and always finding the balance between these two things. So that's UAC's um, context. That, that, that's the context behind how we came to the decision to push for this. Um, and I'll turn it over to Nell to not only share kind of what the timeline looked like, what steps we took, but also what the end result was. Great. This is Nell. Um, thank you so much, uh, Zoe, for providing that very important context. Um, if we could go ahead and go to the next slide. So this slide reads fighting for a disability resource and cultural center. And we honestly use the word fight intentionally because it was a fight from the students to bring to the attention of the administration, our needs, our wants, because both are honestly worthy of being honored. I think something that is often dismissed in these conversations is, oh, needs are priority number one, but our wants as a disabled, as disabled people, as a disability community are valid and should be honored. And we have the right to fight for that and make that clear. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, we'll go through the timeline. On this slide, there are seven uh, rounded boxes, purple boxes, with a light purple large arrow moving from left to right. Um, and these seven boxes in basically present seven different time periods of this fight for the combined disability resource and cultural center. On the left side, um, in 2015, we, the, in late 2015, the SDSE, or again, the Subcommittee on Disabled Student Experiences, decides to fight for a combined DRCC. So that's the abbreviation for the Disability Resource and Cultural Center. Um, and so that was the project deemed by the chair to be the project for the year, and it was to expand the current Disability Resource Center at UIC. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details of what those asks were on the next slide, but I'm gonna first provide the context through this timeline before getting to those specific asks. But ultimately the decision for this specific request and ask and fight was because 
the goal was to address the lack of genuine recognition of disability culture on campus. Uh, we wanted our campus to respect disability as an identity and to move away from this notion of legal compliance only to actually acknowledging and also celebrating disabled identities, um, which students on campus recognize and wanted that to be honored and met and, and to have it happen. So in 2016, there was a plan created by the SDSE. There was a petition written. A lot of student opinions were collected to make sure that this was indeed the action that was going to be supported by our community. And also there was a lot of research being done about other universities that already had disability cultural centers available to them. And also in doing that research, we specifically identified why we wanted to combine the resource and the cultural center together. Going back to Zoe's point of access needs, accommodations are part of disability culture and they cannot and should not be divided. We as disabled people should not be forced to have to decide, oh, today I'm going to one building to meet my accommodations, but I can't go handle, I can't go be in community with the people at the cultural center because it's in a different building across campus. So in 2017, um, the petition was circulated for the DRCC for nearly an entire year. Um, and during which time that leadership of the SDSE actually shifted and Zoe became chair at that time. And by December of 2017, 1,352 signatures had been collected, the large majority of whom were not disabled, actually. So not only were disabled students advocating for this, but non-disabled allies were clearly supportive and understanding the need and desire for this and wanted to support our community to give us the space that we deserve. In late 2017, this is where we hit, let's call a road bump. <laughs> um, the petition was presented to UIC's administration and pretty promptly rejected in, let's say, painful ways um, and leave it at that. Um, and soon after that rejection, as uh, SDSE was trying to regather and determine what our next steps were going to be, Late January 2018 comes along and there's a campus-wide announcement that there's a new disability cultural center that's going to be created, which hooray and also what? Um, the students, our group were really, it was a both and situation of awesome, you heard us, you heard that we are a culture, you heard we have cultural value and that we needed a space and also you completely ignored us because you forced, are going to force us to decide between accommodations and community. And we were upset by that. Um, and so in early February of 2018, we wanted to make it clear that we had done all of this work as a community, as students and this research that we had presented with the knowledge of these are our needs, these are what we see happening, and you ignored that. So we organized and hosted a protest um, in UIC's, oh, it's been a while since I've been at UIC. What's the building, friends? University Hall. <laughs> Thank you, University Hall. Um, COVID brain is a thing. <laughs> um, my transition to my job was right after, like right before COVID started. So like it's two different lifetimes effectively. Um, so yes, at University Hall, we gathered and began to protest and we were actually intercepted by the Dean of Students at that time who had arranged a sit down meeting for us with the provost and others upon hearing and acknowledging our needs and requests and our frustrations. So we did have this conversation with them to express these concerns we had in that um, the, the DRCC, the combined center was not being met, that we were excited to have a disability cultural center. And also we were torn that we are now going to have to go to two separate spaces for to meet all of our needs. When most of us don't have the spoons or the energy to go to two different places for, in the same day if you have other things going on too and especially if they're not side by side but nonetheless in february 20 on february 26 2018 the disability cultural center at uic did officially open and it's been really great to have it i've been very happy to see all of the uh 
um, events taking place from afar on Facebook, watching, kind of observing what's going on. So that is exciting. But we'll talk a little bit more about the demands of the petition first. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So with the demands of the petition, we had three simple demands. One, we wanted to expand the DRC, so the Resource Center, to provide more accessible space so that it was in an accessible area. As Zoe mentioned, it was far away and the space itself was tight. Um, to allow disabled students to come together for meetings, cultural programs, and community building. The work that SDSE was doing, having to piecemeal where we went, how we made that happen. The second one was to increase the DRC budget to fund cultural programs and a full-time professional staff person to facilitate such programming, because we recognize that having a space wouldn't necessarily ensure that the programming would be done through a paid position so that the labor could be intended and focused on these things for our community. And three, the change to change the name of the DRC to the Disability Resource and Cultural Center to reflect the cultural component that already was officially recognized as a cultural center. Um, so just going back to that timeline in the end, yes, the UIC administration did approve the creation of a new disability cultural center separate from the Disability Resource Center. And it was separate, it remains separate from the Resource Center. And that is not what students asked for. That is not what we researched. That is not what we were naming as needed. Um, so that is just a little bit about how the DCC was born directly out of student action and how this is a first important step for what hopefully whatever the students need moving forward at UIC. Um, Haley and myself are no longer there, Zoe still is, but there's also other students and a new generation there doing that fight. So moving on to Haley uh, to talk through the five key takeaways. Thank you, Nell and Zoe. So as Nell said, I'm going to talk about some of our takeaways from this um, fight for cultural space, cultural recognition. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So the first one is talking to people. Um, and this really includes having some hard conversations. Um, I'll start with some of the easier conversations first. So something that's very helpful that we really encourage people to do is talk to people at your institution who have been there for a long time, who have historical memory. Um, this, one of the reasons that we identified a cultural center as being so needed is that we had conversations with Dr. Carol Gill, um, who used to be the chair of the um, Chancellor's Committee on the Status of Persons with Disabilities. And she had told me when I was chair that, oh, we used to have this student organization, the Disabled Student Union, um, you know, it fell apart. Um, and with conversations with other students, we talked about how, well, a student org is always kind of following a, a student, a person, and it can very easily go away, right? If a student graduates, there's not new officers, um, maybe, you know, the attendance in the organization drops. So we, through these conversations, identified what we need is something different, something that's actually institutionalized, um, something that isn't attached to a single person, but rather is reflective of our entire diverse community. Um, in terms of having the hard conversations, we met with a lot of different administrators, um, and some were wonderful, and others were extremely ableist. Um, we had to find ways to gently um, and yet firmly push back against this ableism, um, and also just do some very basic education. <laughs> so, for example, I remember in one of our early meetings, um, I was told there actually aren't that many disabled students on campus. And I had to explain that not all disabled students are disclosing and registering with the DR, uh, the District Resource Center, and that is not a good way of counting disabled students, right? Um, that's just like one of many examples where the administration didn't have very basic knowledge of our community, um, the challenges our community faces, the victories our communities have, has had. So we really had to be very um, specific about that and really educate them on those things. And that's part of letting people ask you questions too. So um, we really took the time to try and do this education, which was of course additional labor, but it was essential in helping the administration understand where we were coming from and why this was so important. And um, I think Zoe put in the chat, not to mention a small subgroups of students would still matter. Yes, and we talked about that too, right? Um, 
that it doesn't matter how many numbers there are, right? That if we're really committed to culture and social change, um, that it shouldn't be uh, a numbers game, right? Even though disabled people are, you know, one of the, one of the largest marginalized groups in the United States. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also, as, as Mel mentioned, we had a lot of um, allies participate in our petition, which honestly was a, you know, a, in a sense a surprise, but also just really encouraging, um, especially reading a lot of people's comments. Um, some people with other marginalized identities would even mention other cultural centers and, you know, and really recognizing like the I'm one of the reasons I have been able to succeed at UIC is because of the Latino Cultural Center. And, you know, I fully support my like fellow disabled students um, getting right this, this cultural center of their own. Um, so it's really important to seek allyship. Um, and of course, and still ensuring that the, you know, um, most marginalized are centered in our movements, um, but that we're also building like cross movement solidarity. And we actually saw that quite a bit um, with uh, when once the Disability Cultural Center, you know, really took off. There started to be a lot of um, events that were collaborations between the Disability Cultural Center and other cultural centers, which was amazing to see. Um, next slide. Um, uh, Nell and Zoe mentioned this, right? But um, it's always navigating power dynamics. Uh, universities have extremely complex systems of power um, and it can be hard to figure out um, how to, to, to move through them. Um, I found that having a lot of more personal one-on-one -on -one meetings in addition to larger group meetings was very useful. Um, and also at times pushing back against those power dynamics. I will say that one of our allies um, is that kind of midway through this fight, we got a new vice chancellor for diversity, um, Amalia Payeres, and I actually was lucky enough to be on the search committee that hired her. So I ensured that we asked questions about disability, um, which actually weren't on the original interview questions. Um, so I was able to hear, you know, her view of like what disabled students need and it really aligned with our own. And that's one of the reasons I, and I think others on the, on the search committee pushed for her hiring because we saw that she really supported students' vision and understood what we needed on like a deeper level, even though she herself, as far as I know, does not identify as disabled. So having her as an ally made a huge difference. Um, next slide, please. Combine fact and emotion. Um, so, we, we tried to do basically kind of two ways of presenting information and demands to those in power. Um, one, we really sought to have like quantitative data um, because we knew that they would respond to that. Um, even though, as Zoe said, numbers shouldn't matter. And often in large universities, they do, they matter very much. Um, but then we also would share a lot of qualitative data with them. And that included those of us who were in these meetings or at times we even crashed the chancellor's um, like special question sessions, um, which he loved. Um, but we would share like our experience, our lived experiences as disabled people, um, as disabled graduate students, disabled undergraduate students, disabled teaching or graduate assistants. Um, and this was really important because, right, we we can't just be numbers on a page, right? Like we have to be, unfortunately, due to ableism, we have to fight to be humanized in people's eyes, right? And um, that's something that we really focused on is both having that quantitative aspect, but also really sharing, these are our identities, this is our culture, here are, you know, diverse aspects of our community, um, and in, kind of inviting non-disabled people into what our lived experiences are and what our community is like. And then the final takeaway, please. Um, focus on inviting, not accusing. Um, so, right, how do we call people in versus calling people out? And also thinking about how to be strategic about that, right? Um, as I mentioned, there were definitely times where uh, the chancellor and other high up administrators were becoming very frustrated with us um, because, you know, we we're creating a lot of good trouble. Um, 
And we really had to remain like calm and patient. There were times in meetings that administrators would get visibly and audibly upset with us. Um, and we had to just, like I said, in the first takeaway, we had to just keep working to educate them, to explaining our position, um, to holding firm to our demands um, and not like uh, trying to, you know, say, okay, we understand you don't have the money, even though we know you have the money, um, right? Like actually holding our ground um, and making sure that they understand, like we're inviting you also to join us, right? In our culture, this is this cultural center isn't gonna just benefit disabled people, right? It, it benefits everyone on UIC's campus. And that includes faculty, staff and administrators, right? Of course, it's for the students, by the students, um, but we really had to ensure that the administrators understood that this is really for the broader community and something that we need if we're really going to be committed to cultural change and social justice. And then I think we have a final slide that just has our contact information. Um, I forgot to put my Twitter on there, but like now I'm kind of a rare user. Um, so if you have any questions, we invite you to email um, us or, you know, uh, Zoe's website is also on there. Um, my website is just my name at uh, .com if you're interested. Um, but we're happy to have further conversations with people about this um, and hope to hear from, uh, from others what they are doing, what they're trying to do, and see how we can support them. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for that amazing presentation. Um, learned so much um, about, you know, the student perspective, right? Like, you know, there's staff advocacy, faculty advocacy, but students are at the center of higher ed, right? So getting your insight is incredibly invaluable. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, so for the sake of time, we might have to forgo the Q&A because we have a few more speakers. Um, Next, uh, we, so we have one more speaker from UIC, and then we'll go allocate the rest of the remaining time to the University of Arizona. Um, so for, for um, we want to give Roxana Stoops, uh, or Stoop, sorry, um, some time to chime in about the UIC effort to build institutional support for disability culture. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself and take it away. Okay, thank you, Javin. I uh, just want to make sure that uh, everything, you know, that the document is uploaded and accessible. Okay, so my name is Roxana Stoop. Uh, my preferred pronouns, she, hair, hairs, fair skin with freckles, uh, brown hair, brown eyes, 68 years old, wearing a red shirt and red glasses, a mother and a proud grandmother of a six-year-old. Latin American woman, first language Spanish and second English, born and raised in Costa Rica from a family of Polish immigrants and now living in Chicago since 2006. Retired from the University of Illinois at Chicago, disability and human rights activist, director of the Disability Research Center, DRC, for 12 years, an interim director of the DCC in transition to its opening for one year. Prior to that, associate professor at the Universidad de Costa Rica, participated in the drafting of the Costa Rican Disability Law, Equal Opportunities for People with Disabilities in Costa Rica, approved in 1996, and a Costa Rican delegate during the drafting of the International Convention on Human Rights for people with disabilities adopted by the UN in 2006. Javin, uh, do you want me to continue with the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, you still have a few more minutes if you'd like to say and continue um, whatever you like to say. Thank you so much. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to thank the director of the DCC, Dr. Margaret Fink, for inviting me to be part of this important and unprecedented, I should say, conversation. And also thanks to Javin for doing a great job at coordinating uh, the symposium. 
My warmest, warmest regards to Dr. Amalia Payares and a disability studies scholar, Dr. Kerry Sandal. I was asked to share my perspective as the director of the Disability Research Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago, a position that I held for 12 years. To be concise and stay within the time frame of five minutes, I'm going to list some of the most relevant historical events that took place at UIC during the years prior to the opening of the DCC in 2019. And you know, I'm talking about what happened between 2008 and 2018 that I believe cultivated the conditions to start understanding disability as part of diversity on campus and consequently facilitated the process of opening the Disability Cultural Center collectively with other cultural centers on campus. In 2006, I'm sorry, in 2008, the chancellor and the provost initiated a campus-wide diversity strategic thinking and planning process in which the USC disability community, including disabled students, faculty from disability studies, the chancellor's committee on the status of persons with disabilities, and the staff of the Disability Research Center played an active role incorporating disability as a topic of diversity. Just for your reference, this was well documented and published as the Mosaic of Transformation in 2010, which is a, a document that you can access uh, online. This university process leads to an internal institutional reorganization. And as part of it, the DRC and six cultural centers were transferred from the Office of Undergraduate Affairs at that time to the newly opened Office of Diversity. This transition of the DRC to the Office of Diversity represented a historical opportunity for the student disability community on campus to be part of an intersectional platform to address common issues of social justice shared among minority groups. And it also contributed to an emergent understanding of disability as another cultural group on campus. At that point, the cultural centers and the Disability Resource Center adopted the name of Centers for Cultural Understanding and Social Change. Just for your reference, and I am not going to mentioned those because Zoe already listed the centers. Um, as a center for cultural understanding and social change, and for the following seven years, from 2012 to 2018, the DRC became an active participant of a joint and intersectional planning and learning process with other centers. Organizing programs of interest across minority groups and a series of disability cultural events. Disabled students and staff were actively involved in planning these programs. Some of them were working at the DRC at that time. Others were active members of other minority groups or were representing the disability student community on campus committees. And some of them were also members of the Disability Studies Student Organization. Well, I'm sorry, organization. There is no doubt that during the years prior to the opening of the DCC, the activism of the USC disability student community was the leading force behind the opening of the DCC in 2019. Their systematic actions that have been already well described, demonstrations on campus, multiple conversations and meetings with the chancellor and the provost finally led to the opening of the USC DCC as we know it today. Was there any challenge faced prior to the opening of the DCC at USC? I would say yes, and I think uh, we agree 
we all agree, you know, Haley, Zoe, and Nell, should the DRC, the unit responsible of providing accommodations and accessibility services to students on campus, be also a disability cultural center? Uh, some argued in favor and others against it, but either way, students from both sides share common experiences, causes, and stories. Finally, in 2018, the Disability Research Center was transferred to another unit within the Office of Access and Equity and the Disability Cultural Center opened as an independent center under the Office of Diversity in 2019 with its own vision and mission and designated budget. Very quickly, because <laughs> I, I, I'm aware of, of my time frame. I'm just going to share with you, based on this brief historical description of events and my experience during those years, I would like to leave you with some practical insights on our path to build a DCC on campus. Collaborating with other minority groups on campus and having their support can be critical to the empowerment of the disability community and its recognition as a cultural group on campus. Joining diversity initiatives and units on campus can be instrumental to have financial support and be part of the university organizational structure. Accessibility can be, can be challenging for the disability community to fully participate. Therefore, making cultural spaces accessible on campus is a challenge that needs to be faced by the DCC. Understanding and defining disability as a preferred identity and recognizing the disability community on campus as another minority group within diversity requires to go beyond the limitations of campus legal compliance. Disability studies academic programs are a referent and a source of knowledge and research for the DCCs. Uh, some campus have those programs and uh, otherwise, you know, these programs uh, in other universities can serve also as sources for that knowledge. Uh, campus surveys, gathering stories and documents that can be helpful to, can be helpful to explore existing beliefs, attitudes and stereotypes about disability on campus. And lastly, Building networks with local, national, and international disability organizations can offer opportunities to learn from other disability cultural perspectives and be part of a larger disability community. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Roxana, for your presentation. That was incredible to learn your perspective on the history of the DCC and how that all played out. Um, Really appreciate your time and energy put into your presentation. And now, so unfortunately, we will be foregoing the Q&A session for the sake of time. So we want to um, allow the University of Arizona representative, uh, Dr. Tony Saya, to uh, take the remainder of the time and a little bit over if she needs to get, share the history <laughs> on, the, uh, on the DCC at the University of Arizona. Um, so feel free to take it away. So hi everyone, as uh, Javin alluded to, I'm Dr. Tony Saya, and I'm an assistant professor at San Diego State University in the Department of Administration, Rehabilitation, and Post-Secondary Education. Uh, I am a uh, disabled woman. I am a white woman in my early 30s. Um, I have pink and black framed glasses, and my hair is uh, blonde with a lot of roots and um, down straight today, which is rare because I tend to have very curly hair and um, the background of me is blurred. Um, and so I'm just really excited uh, to be here and I'm so excited to be uh, back in the DCC um, space and I use she, her pronouns. Um, so before, uh, before I even get going, I want to acknowledge that I really have to embrace what I like to call crip flexibility um, because my computer crashed and I don't have my uh, slides. So uh, please be flexible with me and patient as I try to recall all the information um, from 
from my mind, from my head and mind and, and everything. And so I'm hoping that all goes okay. Um, so prior to uh, becoming an assistant professor at San Diego State, uh, much of my uh, higher ed experience was at the University of Arizona. Um, I did my bachelor's there. Um, well, I, I should say that I, I transferred um, after attending a very inaccessible university, I transferred to the University of Arizona because as, as a disabled woman, even though I didn't have the language for this yet, I knew that I wanted um, college to be an opportunity for me to explore my identity and um, not even necessarily just my disability identity, but going to um, a school that had no access really prevented any uh, identity formation. So I transferred mid-year to um, in January to uh, the University of Arizona. And then I stayed there um, to do my master's and um, my PhD as well. And I just think that that's important context that I bring to the table because before I was in any sort of admin role, I, I was a disabled student um, at the University of Arizona. And um, then I was the first program coordinator of the Disability Cultural Center. And so I have um, that experience and I've kind of been involved um, kind of from the ground up of that. And so uh, I come to the table with a very uh, unique experience. Um, but I want to say that before I even begin talking about the Disability Cultural Center, for the University of Arizona, it's important to acknowledge um, the work that the University of Arizona is doing in relation to just dis uh, disability resource and disability services, um, because I think that that's uh, helped propel uh, the Disability Cultural Center in a lot of ways. So the DRC is um, often labeled as uh, national leaders um, in disability access and accommodations and services for disabled students. They draw in a high number of disabled students. Um, I, I think it's largely because of that, but also because uh, it's located in Tucson, Arizona, which is uh, flat, which is great for any kind of mobility devices. I'm a chair user. Um, I'm still kind of uh, dealing with these, uh, the, uh, this uh, chance to when to disclose my disability status, since I have a very overt disability, I never had the chance prior to pandemic and over Zoom to really choose to disclose. So I'm still kind of um, working with that experience because it is it is new, right? I never had the opportunity uh, prior to the Zoom land to choose to disclose. And, um, you know, for my work, it's really important to disclose. And I'm very proud of my identity, of course. But it's definitely this new space to be in. Um, but I think that uh, it's important to acknowledge that um, the Disability Resource Center was uh, established, it predated the Americans with Disabilities Act. So many disability services offices actually came after the Americans with Disabilities Act, but that's not the case for um, the U of A, and I think that's important to acknowledge. Um, and again, I think that because we very much operated from a social model approach to disability services and accommodations, a cultural center was just the next step. I'm not, I'm not here to say that that was an easy next step or an easy jump, um, but I think um, it really fit with the level of work that uh, the University of Arizona was already doing in um, access and accommodations. So I will say uh, our fight looked a little bit different. Instead of a fight for um, to say we needed this, I feel like our fight uh, came uh, towards funding um, because I think that the leadership of the Disability Resource Center and the students, we were kind of all on board. And so we looked for a way. Um, so again, before I became the program coordinator, I was just a disabled student, right? And saying, it's great that we have all, you know, all this this Disability Resource Center, and we have um, a lot of adaptive athletic programs, which also contributed to a culture, right? You know, we didn't, it's almost like, you know, we had some of what a DCC was calling for because we had um, a lot of uh, disabled athletes coming in and out, and there was, there was more to, than just disability services happening within the DRC anyway, because we have an adaptive athletic center and um, accessible gym and things like that. And so again, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that 
that looking for funding for the DCC really just fit. Um, and so the way uh, that the we decided to go for funding was through an internal grant, which was um, the student services fee grant. And these were grants um, that the institution gives out that enhance the experience and, and positively impact um, students on campus. So they're not related to just obviously disability. You can go and um, you approach the board with your idea. And, uh, you know, your, uh, your idea obviously has to positively impact students. And of course, um, we felt and uh, we know that a disability cultural center would, would fit that. And so this is how we we kind of started. Um, so the way this process worked was um, first you go in front of, of of this board of students, and you have five minutes to state your claim. And you could submit, I think, two like one page documents. Um, and so we use those documents for what uh, Zoe, Nell, and Haley alluded to is like the data. Right. Um, and so we we pointed out, right, we have, you know, they're the largest growing minority group. We have we we are the U of A and, and we are nationally known for disability services, but it's time to up our game. Right. We can't remain stagnant. And so we really used our current position to push us forward. Um, and then I, along with another uh, student, were chosen to be in the room for the five minutes. Um, and we really had to drip. That's when I used the qualitative approach of we have to drip the faucet hard. In higher ed, oftentimes you hear, you know, you want to call people in, you got to know how to drip the faucet. This five minutes was really about uh, dripping the faucet hard on the need and the why and a really positioning, you know, do we want to remain stagnant in disability services or do we want to uh, continue to be a, a leader in, in uh, disability? Uh, things. And so um, that was really nerve wracking. First of all, as a disabled, as an overtly disabled person, share, having five minutes felt like I was carrying the world, um, you know, because I wanted it so badly. And now I had to convince a, a room of people that had limited understanding of disability at all, right? Forget about disability services, but this is a group of students, right? Like, this is not their area. And um, and it's hard, right? It's hard to get people on board right away to see, viewing disability as an aspect of diversity because so often disability were left out of those, um, you know, those conversations. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the time and I'm trying to speed it up. So, um, you know, so it was really difficult, but I think we, we led with the facts and we did do a pre-survey where people um, admitted that they wanted a cultural center and felt that disability did not get the same attention that other diversity initiatives got across campus. So we, we used that in an anecdote as well. We were successful in receiving funding, although we didn't get the answer um, so it felt like, uh, you know, you're like waiting for a test exam. You're waiting for the, the results. It felt like forever. It probably was a couple of weeks, but in my mind, it felt like a year. Um, we, we were successful in getting funding. However, we only got funding for one year for $50,000 um, because we already had a space. We intentionally selected a place within the, the Disability Resource Center because it was very accessible. Um, we, we didn't want to forego accessibility just to have it. Um, and I will say, just to piggyback off some of the things Zoe, Nell, and uh, Roxanne and Haley shared, you know, for us, we just wanted it so bad that we, we didn't want them to be able to use space as a reason. Now, later on into the discussion, I see a lot of pros, pros and cons and somewhere in the middle of where to put the space. Um, but for us, it made sense that we already had a very accessible space, so we don't want to lose that just to be uh, where the other cultural centers are or other things like that. And so we did, again, uh, get that $50,000. Um, but that it's really difficult to start a space with $50,000. Um, and so I started as the first part-time coordinator. And um, I, no one on this campus knew much about disability culture except all the people that are involved. So we really had to uh, 
you know, get people on board and it was very successful. And I just, for the purposes of this conversation, I do want to say, I'm going to skip ahead, but we were able to um, get sustained funding from 2019 to 2020-21. We were able to get $98,000 from the same student services fee um, which was nice because we had some of that institutional buy-in. Can you do GCC work with only that budget? No, um, but it, it definitely showed some institutional buy-in. Um, I feel like I went rapid fire. I probably have a lot of holes. Um, I was trying to make up time um, and hit on everything, but um, I just want to make sure that I, I said this clearly. So the UADCC opened in 2018 for their first inaugural year. We had $50,000. And then for um, 2019 to 2021, we got $98,000. Um, I will paste my email in the chat um, if anybody wants to reach out. Obviously, I'm no longer at the center, but I'm still very involved. And um, I, if, if you need any of uh, the support about you know what to write, where to, what information to share, please reach out. Um, and thank you so much for being flexible. I knew in this community of all communities, this is the community for your computer to crash seconds before. Um, and so uh, thank you so much. And I'm so, so excited as another disabled woman to be in community with other disabled people today. That was amazing. Thank you so much. I know that uh, we ap apologize that we didn't give you as much time as you deserve. Um, and your story, nevertheless, was incredible. Um, you touched on so many great points, especially the funding. I think a lot of people are wondering what the funding is like and how that's decided and what ways to get it. Um, and we'll learn more about that tomorrow or in the Saturday sessions um, that we'll talk about more about the futures and how to advocate for those kinds of things. But I just want to say thank you to Nell, Zoe, Haley, Roxana, and Tony, uh, representing both UIC and UA, uh, University of Arizona. Uh, thank you all for your for sharing the knowledge with all of us um, and sharing your insights and for your labor and for your advocacy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the access workers and to, yeah, of course our panelists. Um, We'll be taking a break until five o'clock central, so it's about 27 minutes from now, um, when we'll come back together for a final histories panel, this time learning about the University of California, Berkeley, and Miami University, Ohio's Disability Cultural Centers, and they're pretty unique in that they are combined with their Disability Resource Center, which is why we paired them together. So see you in less than half an hour, and have Thank a... Thank you. Have a good break. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Thank fellow everyone. panelists. Thank you.